Thank you. Um, this is amazing, by the way. Mariella, congratulations. Um, so, uh, first thing, I'm a journalist. I'm not a, not a doctor. I'm not a, a PhD. And I had the opportunity. I was a journalist who was obsessed with um, the bad science, controversial science. And I wasn't the first journalist to look into this uh, obesity, nutrition, diabetes question. But I, I was lucky enough to come along at a time where the research, there are actually courageous researchers in the community who had opened their minds to the possibility that there was something behind this ketogenic diet nonsense. Um, so I came along. Steve Finney had been one of the first who had been in this and fighting the establishment since the late 70s and that he's still saying is a tribute to humanity, to Steve. Um, Eric Westman was one of the people I got to spend time with and David Ludwig at Harvard. So I just had this opportunity as a journalist to come along at a time when there were people who could convince me or at least argue that this wasn't uh, what the medical community perceived it to be um, and taught me that uh, the orthodoxy is not always even vaguely right. So the talk I'm going to give is my learning experience basically in the um, uh, 10 years that I was doing this research from the late 90s through uh, the completion of my first book and um, what in fact I had learned that I had no idea about which was in part um, that uh, there was another way to think about obesity entirely that the medical community had passed over. Um, so my financial and disclosures, I have uh, no traditional disclosures. I write books. I get honoraria for giving lectures, um, although not from the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm supported these days by CrossFit for reasons I don't quite understand. <laughs> Um, so the context this is important because we tend to talk about this in the context of what to do, like what is a, what diet we should go on if we're overweight or diabetic or, or whatever our chronic disorder is. But the context to me has always been that we have this obesity and uh, diabetes epidemics going on worldwide. So in 2016, Margaret Chan, who was then Director General of the World Health Organization, uh, gave a talk at the National Academy of Sciences in, in Washington, D.C., in which she, she referred to the obesity and diabetes epidemics as a slow motion disaster. And she mentioned that in 1974, there were 105 million adults who were obese. And by 2014, 40 years later, this number had grown four, sixfold to 640 million. And the, gave a, an estimate at this talk for the probability of keeping a bad situation from getting much worse, which is fascinating. So this isn't whether or not uh, health organizations like the WHO would be able to uh, curb these epidemics or stop them, but whether they would just prevent them from getting worse. And her estimate for this happening was virtually zero. And under the circumstances like that, the first thing that you would assume the medical research community would do was question their assumptions. Like if we've completely failed to date to curb the obesity and diabetes epidemics, and the leader of the World Health Organization is predicting with almost total certainty failure in the future, maybe there's something about these epidemics we don't understand. Maybe we got something wrong. And this is a theme I'm going to return to also in my talk tomorrow. But this is what I wanted to find out when I launched my research into this. Is there a possibility that everything we've been hearing is based on assumptions that have never been rigorously tested? And this is a quote I like just in, in physics, a field I grew up in studying physics. And in physics, you learn the science with the history attached. So you learn about Maxwell's equations and Einstein's laws of relativity. You learn about what experiments are actually done to test these theories. But in medicine and public health, you don't learn any of that. And the point that Hans Krebs was making, Hans Krebs is a Nobel laureate from the famous Krebs cycle, is named in his memoir of his, his mentor, Otto Warburg, a Nobel laureate, is that without this history, you cannot understand the present tense. In fact, with, if you really understand what you're talking about, you have to understand the history of the ideas and the competing hypotheses and the evidence. And that's in my research, that's what I wanted to do. So the question here is the cause of obesity, the ideology of obesity. And this is a conventional wisdom. This is the, the Newton's laws of obesity. 
Uh, the fundamental cause of obesity and overweight is an energy imbalance between calories consumed and calories expended. There's no more fundamental concept in this entire field. In 2017, a group of uh, prestigious researchers put together a, uh, a review article, 30 pages, on what they called obesity pathogenesis. And this is how they phrase that same concept. From a thermodynamic perspective, it's clear that obesity, generally the consequence of small cumulative imbalances of energy intake and exposure. In articles you read, it's an energy balance disorder. That's how it's phrased. Calories in greater than calories out. The simplest way is we think of it as we overeat. The biblical terminology is gluttony and sloth. Okay, so here's how this hypothesis looks. Um, just too much food, too little physical activity causes overeating, energy in greater than energy out, and the result is the obesity and the obesity epidemic. This is a fundamental bedrock assumption in the field. This is what I believed when I started my research. This is what I believed when I wrote my very first sort of infamous New York Times Magazine cover story on this. Um, this is what we have to ask ourselves, is this true? It's not carved on stone and passed down on tablets from the mountaintop. It's a hypothesis. And you can ask yourself, and you're supposed to ask yourself in a scientific endeavor whether a hypothesis is true. And it turned out, I learned in my research, that there's an origin to this idea and a context. And the interesting thing is, it dates to the invention of this device. In 1866, modern nutrition was born with the creation of a device called a calorimeter that could measure the energy expended by large animals or do uh, humans in this diagram. It's a dog. This was done by German biochemists in the 1860s. From the 1860s to the 1920s, all of modern nutrition was determined by our ability, basically, what we could measure. And science, scientific progress is always determined by what you could measure. The questions you ask are determined by what you could measure, and the answers you get are determined by that. And in this case, you could measure the energy expended by uh, a living being. Used to be, we knew how to measure the energy in foods by burning them in what's called a bomb calorimeter and measuring the heat released. So now you can measure energy in and energy out. And then you can do vitamin studies and protein content studies and fiber studies. So all of that constituted nutrition for 60 years. And through this period, we also, physicists and chemists, worked out the laws of thermodynamics, which were about energy conservation, primarily the first law. And beginning in the early 1900s, a German diabetes specialist, Carl von Neuren, put forth this theory that obesity was caused by this excess energy intake. This is how von Neuren put it in the very first statement of this in the scientific literature. I should say there was always this idea that obese people ate too much. In fact, the word obesus, obesity, comes from the Latin obesus, which means to have eaten until fat. So the assumption is that something about eating too much caused obesity. This is von Neuren's first statement of it that I could find in the literature. It dates to the early 1900s of this as a scientific theory. The ingestion of a quantity of food greater than that required by the body leads to an accumulation of fat and to obesity should the disproportion be continued over a considerable period. Louis Newberg took over in the 1920s with this theory and became sort of to von Neurden what Huxley was to Darwin. Louis Newberg was a, physiologist, a, a, a medical doctor working at the University of Michigan doing research. He had studied with a great uh, Austrian physiologist named uh, Wilhelm Falta uh, in Europe for a few years. And this was Newberg's revelation. He said, all obese persons are alike in one fundamental respect. They literally overeat. Um, and obesity is caused by either perverted appetite or a lessened outflow of energy. We'll talk about what this means shortly. But he was right. The idea is if somebody's getting fatter, they're taking in more food than they're expending in energy. There's a problem with this thinking, though, which Newberg had to confront, and what everyone does today. Okay, if obesity is caused by taking in more calories than you can spend, and, and you, the obese person knows that, the question then becomes, why don't they compensate? Okay, we'll talk about how few calories we're talking about, so it should be easy to eat a little less or expend a little more and reverse it. Everybody in this room probably has gone through that exercise. And these are under conscious control. So Newberg, in his very first papers, took what was a physiological disorder, which is excess fat accumulation, and he turned it into a behavioral disorder. He said they, the reason they don't compensate is because they suffer, he said, from various human weaknesses, such as overindulgence and ignorance. <clears throat> 
So what you do is you take this problem with full body energy balance that's in theory here or here, and you put the cause in the head. Ignorance, self-indulgence, gluttony, and sloth. These are all behaviors. And to the obesity research community, as I learned doing my research, this is actually a very simple concept, and it seems kind of obvious. And if you ask them, which I did in the course of my research, how do you know this is caused by eating too much? Basically, this is why. Falstaff in Shakespeare, who had this great lust for life, he was eating and drinking, and he's fat. And you see this association between the two, and you assume this is the cause. And then there was this question. People, when they're starved, as often was the case in concentration camps in Europe, and I would hear this from the researchers, they came out thinner. You starve any human or animal, obese or lean, and you will get a much leaner organism. So the question, though, then becomes, you have to ask, what kind of effect are we trying to explain by this? And remember, I talked about this with Newberg. Why don't people compensate? So one of the questions that was asked even as early as the 1920s is how much, when we're talking about energy balance, weight management as the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. Uh, would say is that all about balance, balancing the number of calories you consume with the number of calories your body uses or burns off. The question is how much? How big is this effect we're trying to explain? So if you ask this question, how many calories do you have to store in your fat tissue to gain 20 pounds of fat in a decade? Okay, that's 40 pounds in 20 years. That would be going from lean in your 20s to obese in your 40s, as many of us do. It's two pounds of fat a year. The easy calculation, Zoe goes crazy whenever I show this, because she does a presentation, a blog, and a talk about this 3,500 calories. But if we are to assume, as the community does, that a pound of fat is approximately equal to 3,500 calories of energy. This is the calculation. These are the numbers. So two years times 3,500 calories in a pound of fat divided by 365 days. It's eighth grade mathematics. And the answer you come to is that gain two pounds of fat a year, 20 pounds of fat in a decade, you have to store 20 calories of fat in your fat tissue every day that you don't expend. So that's the equivalent of two peanuts worth of fat, or four olives, or two gummy bears. Pick your poison. It's 0, 0.00 positive energy balance. So what I mean by that is imagine I'm a big guy. Imagine I eat 3,000 calories a day, um, and I'm in energy balance at 3,000 calories a day. Um, if I burn off or expend 2,980 calories, and 20 of those calories get stuck in my fat tissue every day, I'm going to get obese. There's no way to avoid it. And so assuming each calorie, if each bite of food I take is about 20 calories, that's about 150 bites a day, I burn off or excrete, excuse me, 149 of the 150, and the 150th is trapped in my fat tissue, I'm going to be obese. This is what we're dealing about. And when you think of it that way, you start thinking of this as a fat-trapping scenario. You can ask the question, because after you eat, basically all the calories that you consume as fat get stored as fat, at least temporarily. And that could be 1,000 or 1,500 calories worth of fat a day, depending how big you are and how much you're eating. And again, all but 20 go into your fat tissue and leave, and 20 remain. You're going to become obese. That's what we're talking about. And the obesity epidemic in the U.S., for instance, about which I've written an enormous amount and others, that's 30 pounds of weight since 1960. That's an average weight gain of a half a pound per year. That's five calories a day being stored, a 0 .002 positive energy balance, the equivalent of a half a gummy bear out of everything you've eaten that day. And when I first saw this calculation done by Eugene Dubois, who was a leading authority on metabolism in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s, he put this in his textbook. And he said, considering these numbers, considering how tiny this effect is, there's no stranger phenomenon than maintenance of a constant body weight under marked variation in bodily activity and food consumption. All of food preparation, all of the alcohol that we drink and the sodas that we drink and everything we do all day long is aimed at getting us to consume more calories than we normally would if we had to eat the food rare as we did in Paleolithic times or cooked over a hot fire. And yet, only some of us get fat. And the question Dubois was asking is, why don't all of us get fat? If the only thing you need to do it is to store 20 calories ex extra a day. So now I'm going to show photos from pre-World War II European textbooks. From here on in, I'm basically channeling the way German and Austrian clinicians thought about this research. Um,
prior to the Second World War. And I'm going to use photos from the textbooks back then because they thought it was important to understand not just whether somebody's a BMI over 30 or not, which is how we define obesity today, but where people get fat and when they get fat and how they get fat, because then you could start to understand this fattening process. So we knew genetics have a, uh, obesity has a huge genetic component. Here's a lean pair of identical twins, and here's an obese pair of identical twins. And our energy balance idea might tell us these are obese and these aren't, because these pair took in more energy than they expended, this pair didn't. But what it doesn't tell us about is why does the fat go to the exact same place? Why are these people built identically? We know identical twins have not just identical faces, but identical body types. So we need a hypothesis that tells us something about where the fat goes. And our energy balance hypothesis doesn't. Animal husbandry, we know certain breeds of animals get fat. And Edwin Aswin, who was a leading high, uh, uh, endocrinologist, hormone specialist in the United States in the early 1960s, who gave a talk very similar to the talk I'm giving today, argued, he said, consider the pig as corpulence and gluttony resulted from man's artificial selection. Selective breeding provided us with this hope, with this hoggish ways, and no one will convince me that his gourmandizing is provoked by parental oversolicitude. The theory at the time was kids get fat because their mothers and fathers feed them too much, or the mothers care too much about them. When they get upset, they give them treats instead of making them go outside and exercise. And Asa was just making the point, what about obese animals, fat animals? Their parents don't care, and yet they grow fat anyway. Men and women fatten differently. Men fatten above the waist, women fatten below the waist. Um, our, uh, and this man, by fattening above the waist, doubled his risk of obesity, uh, excuse me, doubled his risk of heart disease. She didn't. So the question is, what does that have to do with how many calories are consumed and expended? And even if they both overate to get fat, they both took in more calories than they expended, why did the man get fat in one place and the woman get fat in the other? And it tells us clearly sex hormones are involved in fattening. And puberty is a good example. Um, and again, this is a clearly not a pre-World War II photo. Um, boys and girls enter puberty with roughly the same amount of body fat. As they go through puberty, they both get bigger, they both get taller, they both take in more calories than they expend, but the boys lose fat and gain muscle, and the girls gain fat, and they gain fat in very specific places. And so the idea is for puberty, in fact, by the time the girls leave puberty, they have about 50% more fat on their bodies than the boys do. So it's a, 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 a dipogenic or obesogenic experience puberty is, but it clearly has nothing to do with caloric intake and expenditure. It's clearly due to, well, growth hormone, an insulin-like growth factor would explain the growth, uh, growth hormone and, and, and others would explain the muscular development in the boys, and sex hormones would explain this differential development in men and women. It's a hormonal phenomenon. So, the fundamental problem with this energy balance idea, and this is the thing that's still sort of, I can't quite get over. In a way, I've spent the last 20 years trying to understand how this has happened. Um, energy balance, this idea that obesity is caused by energy balance, imbalance, is a tautology, not a hypothesis. So the logic is circular, which is a classic example. You can't, there's nothing you can actually measure. If you ask the question, why do we get fat? The answer is because we're overeating. And then you ask, how do we know we're overeating? And the answer is because we're getting fat. And why are we getting fatter? Because we're overeating. And you just go in circles. You get an explanation for what happens when you get fatter. You don't actually get an explanation. You get a description of what happens when you get fatter. You don't get an explanation of the process. So if you think about it from a different perspective, various metaphors we could use to understand this. This is, again, the World Health Organization on obesity. The fundamental cause is an energy imbalance between calories consumed and calories expended. Now, imagine instead of having come from a symposium on, on diet and weight and health, you would come to a symposium on wealth generation. You wanted to learn, instead of how to get leaner and healthier, how to get wealthier. And your very first speaker was presenting his theory on how to get wealthier and what causes wealth. And his theory was the fundamental cause of wealth is a money imbalance between dollars earned and dollars spent. Would you start thinking about getting your money back? Okay, because you know you have to restrict the amount of dollars spent. Dollars in are greater than dollars out. That's all you have to know. If you ask the question, why is Bill Gates a billionaire and I'm not, the answer is because Bill Gates took in more money than he expended and I didn't. 
And the joke is, I do take in more money than I expend, but I'm still not a billionaire. So the theory doesn't tell us anything. Um, why did we embrace this idea? Okay, if somebody gets fatter, they have to take in more energy than they expend. That's the conventional wisdom. It comes from the first law of thermodynamics, which again, when this theory was being generated, there was a lot of talk about thermodynamics. That was one of the great triumphs in the physics of chemistry world. So delta E is a change of energy in a system is equal to E in minus E out. You actually see this written in papers in various forms still today, 150 years after its first statement. So change in fat mass, which is contingent delta E is equals energy consumed minus energy expended. And the problem, again, is there's no arrow of causality here. This law of thermodynamics doesn't tell us anything about why people get fat. It should never be mentioned in the context of a medical discussion like obesity. And by that I mean if, if a, the energy in a system goes in, you know that more energy went into the system than expended. If this room got crowded, more people entered than left. If I got wealthier, I made more money than I spent. They're all conservation realities. They tell you nothing about why I got wealthier or why the boom got crowded. And we embrace this idea and we institutionalize it as dogma and we describe it as sort of the fundamental cause. And to talk about anything else as a cause of obesity was considered completely inappropriate. In fact, from the very beginning of obesity, people talked about it as being a hormone. People who suffered with obesity said it's a hormonal. There's a, a famous line by a character, uh, a George Bernard Shaw character in 1910 in his play Miss Alliance where he says, you know, some people just put on fat no matter how little they may eat if you're built that way. And this was always perceived as an excuse for the obese person to not have to do what lean people do naturally, which is eat in moderation and exercise. But what I learned doing my research is that there was always an alternative hypothesis, which was precisely this, that it was a hormonal regulatory disorder, that people who are heavy are not just lean people who ate too much, they're people who actually have fat tissue that wants to accumulate excess fat that's trying to grow. So in this hypothesis, obesity is just, it's first principles, obesity is sort of excess fat accumulation. That's the first thing you would say. So if you're a physician and an obese person with obesity walks into your office, you don't think about how much they eat or how much they exercise. You know nothing about that. For all you know, they could be marathon runners. What you know is that they have excess fat accumulation. So that's the very first observation you make. It has no assumptions attached to it. And in this hypothesis, as we'll see, gluttony and sloth are compensatory effects. They're not causes. So we switch the direction of causality in this first law of thermodynamics. The conventional wisdom is that changes in intake and expenditure, intake greater than expenditure, causes energy intake to go up. And this alternative hypothesis is that energy storage is very well regulated, as everything else is in the human body. And if you dysregulate that and you cause intake storage to go up, it'll have compensatory effects on how hungry you are, energy in, and how much energy you want to expend. So this was a history, this had a history too, as I learned doing my research. It was a German-Austrian hypothesis pre-World War II. The two leading um, proponents were Gustav von Bergmann, who is the leading authority in uh, internal medicine in Germany in the first half of the 20th century. Today, one of the most prestigious prizes of the Germany, German Society of Clinical Medicine is the Gustav von Bergmann Award. Uh, the Gustav von Bergmann Medal, and then Julius Bauer, who was one of the uh, pioneers of genetics and um, uh, chronic disease research at the University of Vienna in uh, Austria. Bauer fled uh, the, the Nazis in 1938, moved to first Baton Rouge, Calif uh, Louisiana, and then Los Angeles, California, where he finished off his career. If you know any Austrian researchers, Today, um, and you ask them about Julius Bauer, if they're in biology they will, or endocrinology, they'll, they'll know his name. These are not quacks. So this is how Bauer put it um, in a 1941 article in the Archives of Medicine. And before I can read this, I'm going to have to explain this term right here, lipophilic or lipophilia. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to explain why people, uh, how and why people accumulate excess fat, they needed a term to explain the tendency of tissues to uh, accumulate fat when other tissues might not, a sort of characteristic of tissues that they're 
they're uh, uh, ready and willing to accumulate fat. So if you look at, you think of your own situation, there are places we get fat, and we all know where those are, like love handles or double chins or you name it, we all tend to be very, uh, 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 you know, cognizant to, to wear. Um, and then there are places we don't, that we don't think about, like the back of your hands or the, your forehead. And in fact, one of the cases that sparked this terminology was at the turn of the, the 19th century, there was a young girl who had a bad burn on the back of her hand, and they had taken a graft of skin from her stomach and put it on her hand, and then when she grew up to be an adult, she had a big tuft of fat on one hand and not on the other. And so the observation was clearly there was something about the tissue from the stomach area that accumulated fat when the tissue on the back of the hand doesn't. And they needed a term for that, and the term was lipophilic, which means love of fat. And the assumption was that maybe just as some tissues are more lipophilic than other tissues, some people are more lipophilic than others. So Bauer said in 1941, he was actually quoting a, a this was an English um, translation of an article he had written in Germany in 1928. He said, like a malignant tumor like the fetus, the uterus or the breasts of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. And by the uterus, if you think about it, what he meant, the fetus, what he meant is a child is going to grow whether or not the mother increases her food intake or not. So a mother who gets pregnant is going to gain weight both the the child she's, she's giving birth to and uh, fat to feed that child, and she will do that whether she could increase her intake or not. The, the, the fetus and the fat tissue, in effect, will take what they want, take what they need, and the rest of her body will have to adjust to compensate. So she, Bauer said it maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. A lipomatous subject may die of starvation and still remain lipomatous. And all of this is a way of saying that this fat accumulation has an agenda of its own that's independent of the nutritional state of the organism, how much it's eating or exercising. So by the late 1930s, this hypothesis was becoming widely accepted. It had to wait in the United States until 1933 when there was an English translation of this sort of seminal German language textbook on metabolic diseases. But once that translation existed, it started to take off. And by 1938, Russell Wilder, who was a leading diabetes specialist at the famous Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, said the effect after meals of withdrawing from the circulation even a little more fat than usual and then think about it, 20 calories a day, just a tiny bit, might well account both for the delayed sense of satiety and for the frequently abnormal state taste for carbohydrate encountered in obese persons. A slight tendency in this direction, again, 20 calories, 10 calories, would have a profound effect in the course of time. The hypothesis deserves attentive consideration. Hugo Roney, who was a, a Hungarian endocrinologist who emigrated to the U.S. in the 1920s, wrote the first monograph on obesity in, 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 in the United States in 1940. He described this hypothesis that was more or less fully accepted, chiefly in Germany, by a number of leading investigators. What you have to realize is pre-World War II, the lingua franca of Medicine was German, and if you wanted to keep up with, the, with the, the advances in the science, you had to be able to read the German language literature. And this just vanished with the Second World War. It was one of the many uh, tragedies with the war, and the alternative hypothesis evaporated. And you can actually see it happen in the literature. Okay, So in 1941, Bauer writes the article that I was quoted uh, in the uh, Annals of uh, Internal Medicine, in which he... he talks about the energy balance theory of obesity. The energy theory of obesity, which considers an only imbalance between intake of food and expenditure, is unsatisfactory. It's a failed hypothesis. And then he talks, it's the distribution of energy that counts. It's how we partition the fuel we consume. Do we store it as fat, or do we burn it for fuel that matters? And the adipose tissue is not merely a passive storing place. And an increased appetite with a subsequent imbalance between intake and output of energy is the consequence of the abnormal analog. Analog is a word that kind of means a genetic predisposition rather than the cause of obesity. And in doing this, Bauer is criticizing Newberg, and he calls Newberg out. So a 20-page paper, or 10-page paper, he spends the first half of it criticizing this energy balance theory. And 
Newberg responds the next year in a 60-page article in the same journal in which in one page he dismisses Bauer and von Bergman's theory as not worthy of consideration. The suggestion of von Bergman so volubly defended by Bauer that the fat cells of obese persons possess an abnormally great avidity for fat and an exaggerated capacity for retaining it finds no support in experiments designed to test its validity. And this is just a a uh, record of the citations of these papers. You know, after a paper is printed, the published other journal articles will cite them. And Bauer's article, published in 1941, by 1959 had been cited 10 times, and then not at all until my books came out, you know, um, uh, 60 years later. Uh, Newberg's articles became basically the, he wrote a second one in 1944. Made, the same points became the basis of the field. And this is the death of a hypothesis. And in partly, it was actually, it was, it was driven by a response to the anti-German. So Bauer was a, uh, an Austrian Jew living in the US, working out of Hollywood, California, and uh, Newberg was considered the leading authority in the field. That's all there was to it. It was uh, anti-German, anti-Semitic um, uh, on some level uh, bias. That, picked one hypothesis over the other. Now the interesting fact here is that um, when you look at animal models of obesity, the first animal model of obesity was published in the late 1930s. All of them, all of them supported this idea that this is a hormonal regulatory disorder. Uh, Jean Maillier, who was a leading nutrition researcher in the U.S. in the 1960s, had a, um, a strain of obese mice that he studied in the 1950s. And he said, these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. They don't get fat because they eat too much. They get fat if they eat at all. This is what we're trying to find. This is a Tarleton. Some people just put on fat if they're made that way, and this is what we have to explain. This is what the animal models confirmed. So if obesity is a sort of excess of accumulation of fat, a hormonal regulatory disorder, the question is what regulates fat accumulation? That's a question every physician should be asking. Okay, the research we read about every day in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the New England Journal, often is discussing what makes people hungry. That even when you find genes that are linked to obesity, they're talked about in the discussion of whether or not they increase intake or decrease expenditure, where the question should be what regulates fat accumulation. Okay, it's the simplest possible question. This is how Hilda Brook put it. Hilda Brook was, she was a uh, German Jewish pediatrician who fled uh, Germany in 1933, moved to the US, worked in Boston, then worked in New York, and noticed in the midst of the depression in the 1930s in New York that there was a high level of obesity among all the children in New York City. She didn't just say a little fat, like roly-poly fat kids in the midst of the depression. And she founded the first pediatric obesity clinic in the United States at Columbia University and in 1957. She said, looking at obesity without preconceived ideas won't assume that the main trend of research should be directed towards an examination of abnormalities of the fat metabolism, since by definition of excessive accumulation of fat is the underlying abnormality. It so happens that this is the area in which the least work has been done. In 1973, after this work had been done, she wrote another book in which she commented that still nobody pays attention to this research. So beginning in 1960, with the invention of a technology known as the radioimmunoassay that allowed physicians to measure hormone levels in the blood accurately, the, the inventors were Rosalind Yalow and Solomon Burson. Yalow won the Nobel Prize for the work in 1977. And the Nobel Committee said it revolutionized medicine. It passed obesity research by completely. But what Yellen and Burson pointed out in their very first paper was that insulin, the hormone insulin, is a principal regulator of fat metabolism. And this is from a 2010 textbook by Keith Frain, the leading authority at the Oxford University. And you just have to, it's got fat storage and fat mobilization and adipose tissue, and it's insulin, 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 and insulin inhibiting mobilization. The hormone insulin works to put fat in fat tissue. And if you want to get fat out of fat tissue, as Yellow and Burson said in 1965, it requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. So it does, it's not about eating less or exercising more. Biologically, if you want to get fat out of fat tissue, you have to lower insulin levels. And I hope I'll have time to discuss how low that is. Um, Yalow and Burson in 1965 put it this way. This is basically the theory that I've been talking about. We generally accept that obesity predisposes to diabetes, 
does not mild diabetes predispose to obesity? Since insulin is a most lipogenic agent, it's actually the most lipogenic agent, chronic hyperinsulinism would favor the accumulation of body fat. You raise insulin, you raise body fat. So here's the alternative hypothesis. When insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. That's textbook medicine. When insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue and the fat depots shrink. That's also textbook medicine. And we secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbohydrates in our diet. So when I did this, this is all in the, the research literature between specifically the research literature on fat metabolism and the physiology of fat storage in the 1960s. And George Cahill co-authored a, co-edited a textbook. He was at Harvard. He co-edited a textbook on this science in 1965 published by the American Physiological Society. So I called him up in 2005 to find out how much of this is still true because who knows, some of this gets refuted. And he said, no, it's true. Carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat. That's textbook medicine, and if you take out these three words, is driving insulin, you're left with carbohydrate is driving fat. So you've got textbook medicine, textbook medicine, textbook medicine, textbook medicine, take out these three words, the logical equivalent, carbohydrate is driving fat, now you're in quackery land. Because the conventional wisdom is that calories drive fat, caloric imbalance, and a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. And now when we're saying carbohydrate is driving fat, we're in Atkins diet keto land. And, but this is all basically this Atkins diet keto phenomena is. If carbohydrates are driving fat, and we know they do it, if it's this hypothesis correct, by elevating insulin, then if you want to lose your accumulated fat, this is the route to do it. So if you look at textbooks, this is the latest edition of the seminal biochemistry textbook used in the U.S., Leninger. And you look up fat accumulation on dipocytes, it tells you this. It says high blood glucose elicits the release of insulin, which speeds the uptake of glucose by tissues and favors the storage of fuels as glycogen and triglycerols while inhibiting fatty acid mobilization. And you look up obesity, and you're back in energy balance land, to a first approximation obesity is a result of taking in more calories. This paradigm was so powerful, this belief system, that even researchers who understand the biology of fat accumulation can't shed this. And it's kept us from making progress for 60 years. So here's the alternative hypothesis. Like any gross defect, obesity is a hormonal regulatory disorder. Like type 2 diabetes, it's so closely associated with type 2 diabetes. That's why it's people like Mariella with the Diabetes Clinic who are making progress in this field, and Steve Finney with Verta Health, who we're going to hear from. Type 2 diabetes and obesity are two sides of the same coin. And if type 2 diabetes is an insulin signaling defect, obesity probably is also. Just as uh, Yallow and Burson suggest, and it's triggered by the carbohydrate content of the diet. Not, not all carbs, okay? The green leafy vegetables have uh, relatively very few carbohydrates per serving because of their water and fiber content. So we're left with basically sweets, sugar, um, which is a phenomenon I'll talk about tomorrow, and these high glycemic index, easily digestible carbs, bread, cereal, rice, pasta. And you can see this is a famous food guide pyramid that became the basis of the U.S. nutrition advice during the... Um, uh, 1990s, 1980s, and 1990s, and during the period when we had an obesity epidemic, we were telling people to eat foods that this, um, and a lot, 6 to 11 servings a day, that this alternative hypothesis said proposed were fattening. So here's a hypothesis. Refined grains, starches, and particularly sugars cause a dysregulation of insulin signaling, and the result is excess fat accumulation, obesity, in the obesity epidemic. So the implications, here's a conventional wisdom. This is from the last edition of the textbook of obesity. All diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce total calorie intake. That's what the authorities believe today. And this would be the alternative biological version. All diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce circulating insulin. And the way to do that is by restricting carbohydrates. So the question, should any of this be surprising? And what's interesting, what I learned doing my research is the conventionalism through the 1960s was basically this. This is uh, the 1969 medical. Farinaceous is a $5 word for starchy. 
Uh, farinaceous and vegetable foods are fattening, and saccharine matters are especially so. Uh, I had this line in virtually, I think, in every book I've written on the subject. This was the first sentence of an article written in 1963 in the British Journal of Nutrition, co-authored by one of the two leading dietitians in the UK. Every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute. And then the great triumph in our nutritional research from the 1960s onward is that we decided that dietary fat was the cause of heart disease and the carbohydrate went from an inherently fattening, something every woman inherently knew, to heart-healthy diet foods that we should eat 6 to 11 servings per day. If you go looking for dietary diets for obesity, which I did in the literature as part of my research. This uh, I found in the late 40s, early 50s, um, five of them published in the medical journals in English, um, all of them identical to this from Graham, whoop, Graham Green, The Practice of Endocrinology. So um, this was from Harvard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, uh, Rush Medical School in Chicago and Columbia. And, Raymond Green was the brother of Graham Green for what he's worth, it's worth, and he was the leading uh, endocrinologist in the UK in the mid-20th century. This was the seminal endocrinology textbook. So diets for obesity, foods to be avoided, bread, flour, cereals, potatoes, all white vegetables, foods containing sugar, sweets, and you could eat as much as you like. The following, meat, fish, birds, all green vegetables, eggs, dried or fresh cheese, fruit except bananas and grapes. So with, with the exception of some of the fruits, this is a ketogenic Atkins diet um, published in medical textbooks in the 1950s. This was just conventional wisdom then. So, and it was interesting. It didn't say we should eat less than 20 grams or 8% of our calories from carbs and 20% from protein. It says you don't eat these foods. They didn't know about the insulin effect yet, as Green would later comment. Um, you don't eat these foods because they're fattening. Okay, if you don't want to get lung cancer, you don't smoke cigarettes because it's carcinogenic, and you could eat as much of these foods as you want because they're not fattening. There's no energy balance thinking involved in this. It's just these foods are fattening, these foods are not. And had we kept with that theory, we might not have had obesity and diabetes epidemics because we would have realized that the foods we were eating were fattening, which would explain why we would get fat. So the catch, and this is why keto is a pretty simple one, and I think uh, I might have gotten this chart initially from Steve Finney, and he may be showing something similar to it in his talks. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, early 1990s, late 1980s actually, um, Ralph DeFranzo and his researchers at the University of Texas San Antonio decided they were going to measure this idea that you, what you need for reducing fat is a negative uh, the signal of, uh, negative signal of insulin deficiency. And they were about the only research group in the world that could do this measurement. And they measured how fat accumulation, fat, fatty acid turnover, so that's fat being mobilized from the fat tissue and then oxidized for fuel in the lean tissue, how that changed as insulin levels decreased. So here's high insulin here and low insulin here, and you could measure as insulin decreased, you could see that fatty acid turnover stays constant. And this would be referred to in the literature. When I did my research, the researchers who studied this talked about the exquisite sensitivity of insulin, fat tissue to insulin. So if fat tissue detects even a little bit of insulin, it shuts down mobilization of fat from the fat tissue. And then below a certain threshold, it basically dumps insulin into the bloodstream and the rest of, excuse me, dumps fat into the bloodstream and the rest of the body starts um, burning that fat. So what you see here is uh, insulin regulation of plasma fatty acid turnover is maximally manifest at low physiological pl plasma insulin concentrations. It's like the body throw, the fat cells throw a switch. When insulin starts to be secreted, they throw a switch here at this threshold and they hold on to fat and the lean tissue does not burn that fat. And if you want to be sure you're burning fat for fuel and not storing it, you have to be below this threshold. And this threshold is very low. And if you're below that threshold, you're basically in ketosis. Your body is dumping, your fat cells are, are mobilizing fat and your liver is generating ketones and you know that you're losing fat. And at the time, physicians were terrified of ketosis. Ketones had been discovered in the urine of uncontrolled diabetics 100 years earlier. 
and it made them nervous. And so the American Medical Association writes a critique of, publishes a critique of low-carb ketogenic weight reduction regimes. It's authored by a cardiologist named Ted Van Italy, who used to know Atkins very well in New York circles and didn't like him. And um, a, a nutritionist uh, with a PhD in nutrition from the Harvard School of Nutrition. And in this uh, critique, which served to uh, stamp Atkins as a quack ever since, I'm going to start at the bottom. They call low-carbohydrate diets bizarre concept of nutrition that should not be promoted to the public as if they were established scientific principles, but they point out that fat is mobilized when insulin secretion diminishes. And what they don't point out is that um, the low-carbohydrate ketogenic Atkins diet does the best job imaginable of lowering insulin levels. It's pretty much that simple. So the end result was this. They wanted to get rid of Atkins. They were afraid this high-fat diet would cause heart disease, and they were worried about Atkins killing people. We know now that that isn't true. This was Atkins. This was the science of fat metabolism and fatty acid stored that implicated carbohydrates and told us we should be eating. If we predisposed, if we had that enlage, as Bauer put it, to, to add fat, then we have to be on this low-carbohydrate diet. Thank you.